Hello and welcome to worship at St. Matthew Lutheran Church of Milwaukee. This is the service for the 25th Sunday after Pentecost, November 10th, 2024. In our opening hymn, we say, Take my life and let it be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, 
I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in Him. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues forever. O The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, you have given exceedingly great and precious promises to those who trust in you. Grant us so firmly to believe in your Son, Jesus, that our faith may never be found wanting. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, beginning at verse 8. These are the verses for the sermon, which has the theme, Running on Full. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid, go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing Psalm 111. Oh, Lord, have 
Our second scripture reading is from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, where the Apostle Paul writes, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, See that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty, might become rich. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We acclaim the gospel.
The Gospel is recorded by St. Mark in chapter 12, beginning at verse 38. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing, All Depends on Our Possessing.
Safe we are anchored in his grace, his mercy, his peace, which are yours from God our Heavenly Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, running out of gas is without doubt a bad experience. At very least, you are going to be running late. You may be exposed to some bad weather, some discomfort, perhaps even some danger. But when we think about it, almost running out of gas is no picnic either. The gas gauge might chime to alert us we are running out, and that'll send us a bit of a jolt through us. An indicator light might start flashing, creating more of a sense of urgency and anxiety, saying, you don't have long. This car is going to stop running. Will I have to walk? Will I have to get in, in a car with a stranger? It's not a pleasant situation to be running on empty. Both Elijah and the widow at Zarephath and her son, all of them were running on empty, but in a much worse way than driving down the highway and realizing you're almost out of gas. As we heard, they were just about out of food. That makes running out of gas look mighty trivial. Hear her words again after Elijah asked her for some food. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. But then we saw the miracle unfold. The container of oil and the container of flour never running out the whole time Elijah stayed with her and her son. It seemed they were running on empty, but actually God was filling it up each day as needed. It turns out we also are running on full in our lives here on this earth. We are, we might think we're not, but we are running on full, filled by the Lord's providence and fueled by the Lord's promises. Providence is one of those words that kind of throws us a, a curveball because it changes how it sounds in its new form. We know God provides for us, but then when we talk about what is the word that describes that, we don't say that's providence, we say that's providence. To observe the Lord's providence providing for his faithful prophet Elijah in his life, let's back up to a little bit before this miracle of the widow's oil and flour not running out. Let's go to a place called the Kareth Ravine, where Elijah was living in desperate circumstances near a little brook, a brook which eventually even ran dry. It ran dry because the Lord had sent a drought on the land because Israel had rejected him, them, Israel had rejected him so severely. It eventually lasted three and a half years. 
But how did the Lord of all creation, the Lord of providence, handle that desperate situation for Elijah? We're told he commanded ravens to fly in every morning and every evening to Elijah with bread and meat. Bird lovers can appreciate how God describes what he does for us and how God uses his creation for the good of his people. We think of being lifted up on eagles' wings. We are reminded of Jesus promising us that not even a sparrow falls to the ground without the Lord God knowing about it. And here we are assured that if push comes to shove, God will even command creatures to do something way out of the ordinary in order that his people may be fed. So that miracle just set the stage for this next miracle of God's providence, the oil and bread, continuing to have enough for another day and another day and another one after that. You know, any day is a good time to review the Bible's truths as set down in Martin Luther's catechism, but with this weekend being Martin Luther's birthday, it's an especially good time. As we consider the Lord's providence, we think of Martin Luther's explanation to the Lord's Prayer, where each of the phrases in the Lord's Prayer is broken out, including, give us this day our daily bread. What does that mean? Luther asks and he answers, God certainly gives daily bread to everyone without our prayers, even to all evil people. But we pray in this petition that God would lead us to realize this, and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. In this instance of Elijah and the widow, God chose to provide in an unusual way, in a miraculous way, something that went beyond the ordinary occurrences in nature and in the world. But we are reminded to recall and rejoice about the ordinary ways that God keeps providing for us. And God moves us to thank him for that. So we hear also Luther explaining the third article of the Apostles' Creed we confess that confesses that God the Father made everything. And we know that he keeps providing for all he has made. All this he does only out of his fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. These miracles by which God provided for Elijah were extraordinary. They were miraculous, something that goes beyond ordinary experience. God calls on us to do something extraordinary, which is to pause and thank him for the ordinary ways that he keeps providing for us. Through loving parents, through the occupations or investments or whatever he gives us, the ways he keeps us clothed and fed. God reminds us that he keeps filling us with so many blessings. We can say these words gladly and sincerely with Martin Luther. Let us also say with the psalm writer, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not that we continue to be filled by the Lord's providence not because of our merit or worthiness, but because God is gracious to us. These words and songs and psalms of thanks are ultimately all fueled 
by the Lord's promises. The Lord's gracious promises to us in his word and sacrament, that's what feeds and fuels our faith, and that's what leads us to want to say thankful things and do loving things. The promises of God. Elijah spoke the Lord's promise to that widow after telling her kind of shockingly after she said, we're down to our last meal. He says, make some for me first. But then Elijah explains, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. These verses and also the second scripture reading we have reminds us that God loves to surprise us with the way he provides for us. Ravens. Ravens are scavenger birds. They're usually just running around picking over dead things, keeping themselves fed. And God says, I will use these ravens to keep my faithful prophet alive. I'll have them, like clockwork, bringing him meals morning and evening. And of course, it's surprising when those containers of ingredients just keep having enough day after day. But consider what we heard in our second reading. Back about 2,000 years in the early church, the church at Jerusalem was struggling the congregations in Macedonia, northern Greece area, were, were struggling arguably even more. After all, we, they are described as being in a very severe trial, and they have extreme poverty. But then this surprising combination, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. That's surprising that you have a situation with extreme poverty and then right alongside it is overflowing joy. Result, rich generosity. God surprisingly provided for his people in Jerusalem by this extraordinary moving of these hearts of people who themselves were in a desperate situation to help the others. But the Lord's greatest surprise is, of course, the cross of our salvation. Where God says this instrument of torturous, horrible punishment, this crucifixion reserved for the worst criminals, this is the source of splendid peace. This is the source of everlasting life. The blood of Jesus, God's Son, purifies you from every sin. This is the great surprise of history that the innocent Lamb of God suffers and dies for the sinners that the King of kings and Lord of lords allows himself to be put to death in this way. That second reading has the Apostle Paul summing it up this way. How did this happen? This very extreme poverty ending up in giving still more that seemed not even to be there to others. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Another part of the Lord's Prayer is forgive us our trespasses. In some translations, forgive us our debts. We just heard that the Lord Jesus Christ became poor. Not just not having much at all in the way of material goods, but becoming poor by taking on massive debt. 
the death of all of our sins. He willingly took it on and was punished so that we might have peace and forgiveness. The Lord loves to surprise us with these great, gracious gifts. I wonder how much of a surprise it was as day after day that oil and flour was there again at the widow's house, just enough for, for that day. It perhaps at some point became something that was hard not to take for granted. Well, of course it's there. We would hope, though, that she continued to give thanks every day for this miracle, that each day there it was again and again. And let that remind us that each day God's mercy is there again, new and afresh every morning. May that be there to refresh us and to refuel us, to power us, to compel us into other ways of serving other people and our God. You know, at the beginning when I mentioned the various unpleasantries of almost running out of gas, one I didn't mention was the aspect of beating ourselves up as we drive along on those last fumes. Why didn't I buy some gas at that last place? Why didn't I fill up when I could? Why didn't I, I look ahead for what I needed, and we realized all of this would be unnecessary if we had just filled up before we left. But what about kicking ourselves for all the failures in our lives, where we remember, why did I do that? Why was I so weak? Why was I so stupid? Well, there our God would say to us, not, why didn't you just fill up back there? He'd say, why didn't you just look up to the cross where Jesus announced he drew all sinners to himself and with all these sinners came all their sins and he paid for all those sins. Why do we sometimes let a particular sin kind of haunt us as though perhaps that one's too big to be forgiven, as though the sacrifice of the Son of God is not sufficient to pay for it? Or do we kid ourselves that if it wasn't for that stumble, we'd, we'd be good enough, that we would have achieved the standard God wanted for, for us, for our salvation? No, we have no shot at the standard that God requires. He requires perfection. And as surely as the Lord Jesus was punished for our sins, he also provides what God demands, holiness and perfection. This Jesus who is full of grace and truth. So now is the time when you can fill up on that. Today, each day, keep filling up on his grace. And we will find that, like another psalm writer has said, our cup is running over. It'll be more than full. When it's running over, we're certainly running on full. Amen. The peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Holy Spirit, teach us the life of loving service we are to live to God out of gratitude for his love, which sacrificed Christ for our sins. Through that death he has made us his very own. Help us be dedicated entirely to him, freeing our energies, our abilities, our time, and our possessions, yes, what we are and what we have, freeing us from a life of serving self to a life of serving God. Do this, dear Holy Spirit, by filling us with the love of Christ. Bless the offerings of time, talent, and treasure that we make to God for his kingdom. Let them be for each of us a delightful privilege and fruits of our faith. Since only offerings given out of love for Christ are acceptable in heaven, increase our love by diligent use of God's word and frequent attendance at the Lord's Supper. All this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We join in the closing hymn. What a joy again to have walked with you and our Lord on our way to heaven. We look forward to seeing you in person here at St. Matthew Lutheran Church, 8444 West Melvina Street in Milwaukee. On Sunday mornings, we have worship at 9 o'clock 
on Monday evenings at 6.30. God be with you and yours until we meet again.